You know, I, I mentioned at the beginning, I worked for two great uh, leaders, George McGovern and, and Joe Moakley. And when I got sworn into Congress uh, for the first time, they sat with me when I got sworn in and I asked them, give me the best advice uh, that you could give me to be a good member of Congress. And uh, Joe Moakley's advice was get to know everybody on a first name basis, get to know whether they have families, dogs, cats, or canaries. And, you know, just because relationship building is important. And Ron pointed that out. He's right. It, it, re building relations is important because you don't want to demonize, you won't demonize somebody you like. I mean, you could disagree, but you'll approach a debate differently. I'm Susan Spurlock, Executive Director of Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University, and I'm pleased to welcome you to week seven of our virtual spring 2021 lecture series, number 46, examining the first 100 days of the Biden administration, a survey course for all. The lecture series continues with this evening's program, Fixing What's Broken on Civil War and American Democracy. 14 days after a mob stormed the Capitol attempting to stop the steal, President Biden declared in his inaugural address that we must end this uncivil war threatening our democracy. Hyperpolarization, partisan tribalism, the politics of outrage, incivility, refusal to compromise, and truth decay had led to a state of division and politically motivated violence. This evening, we welcome a distinguished panel that will discuss what can, be cut, what can be done to turn down the temperature, to answer Biden's call for unity, and focus on the urgent business of governing our nation. It is now my pleasure to introduce Christina Coolidge, a faculty member from the Political Science and Legal Stud Studies Department at Suffolk University, who will introduce this evening's moderator, and our terrific panelists. Christina? Thank you for those of you who have been faithfully showing up. Thank you for the students who are supposed to show up. And I'm really excited about tonight's episode where we're discussing something that is of, of extreme importance to all of us, which is really the health of our democracy and what we can expect out of the Biden administration. I'm especially excited about our panel because we have not only representatives from both parties, but we also have a scholar who can discuss some of these issues. And um, two people on the panel who have actually written some books on the topic. So this would be the first book I would introduce. And this is actually what governs house procedure most members, I'll tell you a small secret, don't read the whole thing. They use the reduced version. And we have Representative Jim McGovern, who is the chair of the House Rules Committee, who was responsible for writing that tomb for each of the sessions of Congress over which his committee presides. And we also have Liliana Mason, who is a scholar of political psychology. And she wrote another book, this one, which explains perhaps to some degree why members and the wider public don't follow those rules. Also joining us is Ron Christie, who is a political strategist and a former member of the Bush administration. Our panel tonight will be moderated by Mike Dean of GBH News. And the real questions here are, what is the health of our democracy? What is the role of civility? And why can't we get it along? So I'm gonna to toss the panel to Mike and hopefully we can unpack some of these issues in a productive and civil manner. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, I think, you know, in your introduction, you went over a lot of what the problems are um, and how we address them is what Congress is trying to figure out. Um, I think that in this new Biden administration, in this new Congress, it's certainly an interesting way to be introduced to these topics during a pandemic. Uh, and that's where I wanted to start with this conversation um, with Chairman McGovern and Mr. Christie and Professor Mason, um, with how this pandemic, as we hopefully come to the tail end of it, if we're coming out of it, how that is shaping the Biden agenda and the, the works of Congress. Uh, and 
Congressman McGovern, I wanted to start with you. Um, what has the last year been like with you and your colleagues? No in-person meetings, um, very little, you know, socializing outside the Capitol. Um, you know, what has the pandemic meant and what will the end of the pandemic mean, more importantly, to the business of Congress? Yeah. Well, thank, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Um, look, it's been challenging. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think makes government function, I mean, one of the things that makes Congress work oftentimes is the, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations uh, where, where you're in a room with somebody, where you can actually have a frank conversation. And we haven't been able to do that very much. And so all of our conversations are virtual like this. It's like being on Hollywood squares. You don't know who everybody, who, every, who, you don't know everybody who's watching or listening. And it's harder to have a kind of a, the kind of same kind of conversation you'd have if we were in a room together. Um, and so, you know, we went through a, a presidential campaign. The country was very, very polarized. Um, and, um, and we weren't all together. So we weren't mingling and socializing like we normally do. Uh, and then, you know, we had uh, January 6th, which is a very traumatic experience uh, for the country and certainly for those people up here. And, um, and you know, there's a lot of raw feelings right now. Uh, and we're, we're still not kind of back to normal. Um, we vote um, in groups. Most of our committee hearings are virtual, uh, but we're all hoping that there's a light at the end of the tunnel and we will get back to a point where we're again in person. Uh, because I think at the end of the day, um, we, you know, we can talk out more of our differences. We can have more candid conversations um, and, and, and we can compromise uh, and get things done uh, for the American people. So it's been challenging, but like everybody who's on this call, we're all hoping that there's a light at the end of the tunnel really soon. So um, uh, in any event, uh, I hope that answers your question. It, it, it does. Um, and we'll, I guess we'll have to see what that agenda looks like. Obviously the Biden administration's uh, first hundred days is the topic of this, uh, the series. Um, when it comes to things like we're dealing with right now, the infrastructure bill or potentially a series of infrastructure and jobs bills, uh, it kind of comes up this, this new definition of bipartisanship. Uh, and Ron and Liana, I want to bring you in on, on this. The, the redefinition, according to the White House, is that if it's popular with people, with on both sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans, then uh, it is considered a bipartisan bill. And that seems to be the way that the Biden administration is going to try to get legislation passed with little to no Republican support. Um, Ron, I'll, I'll go to you. Is that, uh, is that fair? Is that what people want? Uh, is that a way to solve this problem, um, to, to embrace what polls well, legislation that people want to see get done, but that might be um, putting the politics and putting the, the means of Congress secondarily? Well, Mike, good evening to you. Uh, Liliana, good to see you, Mr. Chairman, a pleasure. A very important question, uh, I think that we all have to grapple with. Um, I think the, the president, when he gave his inaugural address to the American people and to the world, spoke very much about unity and bipartisanship and to heal many of the wounds, to move past the divisiveness, not only of January 6th, but I think of a tumultuous four years of the Trump administration, whether you're a supporter or a detractor uh, of that administration. But most importantly, Mike, I think it's this. Republicans on Capitol Hill are sort of scratching their heads and saying, we've used an arcane procedure called budget reconciliation to move forward on many of the Democrats' priorities without receiving Republican input. And I'm a co-founder of a group called NoLabels.org, which I know the chairman is, is very well aware of. And we have nearly 60 bipartisan members uh, in the House of Representatives and a little bit more than a dozen in the Senate. And we had a Problem Solvers Caucus meeting this morning, and it was chaired by uh, Maryland Governor Larry Hogan. You had Joe Manchin. You had Lisa Murkowski. You had uh, Josh Gottheimer from New Jersey, Tom Reed from New York. Bipartisan. And what I found very interesting with listening to those 50 or 60 members of Congress is they all said, one, we've got to try to find a way to do this with 60 votes rather than 50 through reconciliation number one. Number two, we need to demonstrate to the American people we can do business in Washington in a bipartisan fashion. So 
I think the White House is looking at avenues where they can say, well, if it polls well with the Republicans, we're going to do it anyway. But I think there's enough members of the House and the Senate that are going to force the White House to come to the table and negotiate in a more bipartisan manner. Liana, in your research, um, do does it show that people want this kind of bipartisanship? It's one thing that I've been interested in when it comes to hyperpartisanship. Um, do voters on either side actually want their elected officials to reach over the aisle and work on things like an infrastructure bill, or are they so hard bitten onto uh, into their one side or the other that they actually end up? Um, rewarding a lack of cooperation. And that's why we find ourselves here. Um, where are we in, in 2021 when it comes to hyperpartisanship like this? Yeah, so there's two answers to that question. And I think the, the first is that uh, voters on average do approve of these policies that Biden is, is proposing. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, allowing Biden or the Democratic Party to to pass this legislation does come off as a victory for Democrats. And one thing that my research has done is I've looked into sort of the social psychology of intergroup conflict to try to understand partisanship that way, right? Just think about these as sort of warring groups. And then, and then how do we explain that behavior? And what psychologists have found is that people who are part of groups attach their own self-esteem to the, to the status of their group. And people are willing to sacrifice the greater good, sort of the, the, the good of all the people, just to have a sense of group superiority and higher group status. So there are competing, there are competing interests here. The policies are popular, even among Republicans, these policies are popular, but the idea of giving a victory to one party turns an entire other party mm -hmm. off. And so we're balancing between these sort of deeper psychological motivations that are driving people that are just very human feelings um, and the kind of more rational, thoughtful, well, what legislation do I think would be best for all Americans? And when it comes down to it, actually, most partisans end up using that, I would rather be winning type of thinking rather than what makes most Americans the best off. Mm -hmm. Can we go back in time to the way things were, so to speak. Um, you know, Ron, you worked on Capitol Hill and in the Bush White House. Uh, Representative McGovern, you've you know, risen through the ranks to your chairmanship position now. Um, I got the premise here is: Did it used to be better in the 1980s, in the 1990s, in the 2000s? Uh, how did it function then, and is it possible to get back that way? Well, I'll begin. Uh, yeah, it did. It did function better, uh, quite frankly. I mean, I, I I worked my way through college working for Senator George McGovern. No relation, great last name. Uh, I, I thought he was a wonderful senator, but he uh, he worked, uh, you know, uh, very closely with Bob Dole um, on anti-hunger initiatives, um, and uh, they liked each other. McGovern and Barry Goldwater. Uh, McGovern, a big liberal. Barry Goldwater, a big conservative. Got along. When I came, it was a staffer for Congressman Joe Moakley. Um, you know, Tip O'Neill was the Speaker of the House. Bob Michael um, of Illinois was the minority leader. They, they, were, they golfed all the time. They were good friends. They fought over many issues, but there was very rarely an appropriations bill that came to the floor that didn't pass by a bipartisan majority. Uh, when I got elected to Congress, Newt Gingrich was the Speaker uh, of the House. Um, pretty polarizing figure back then, but compared to, you know, uh, you know today, I mean, I'm almost nostalgic because we we passed some ma major bipartisan bills, uh, you know, with the Clinton administration at that time. Now, the, you know, the, the, I think we need to, you know, you at, going back to the first question about what it's been like in the pandemic. I think we we should probably acknowledge that um, you know the polarization that we see, you know, was there before the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic has just made it more difficult to to kind of reconcile our differences. But I think we also need to kind of redefine what bipartisan is. I mean, what's popular in America, for whatever reason, doesn't seem to be popular with a lot of Republicans right now in Congress. And part of it is because Washington is broken. Um, the types of people that are getting elected are people who will say, elect me and I will never vote to increase government spending. Well, I get elected and they, and they don't want to spend any more money on infrastructure or health care. I mean, the majority of Americans want us to do something about gun violence. They want us to strengthen voting rights, uh, getting money out of politics. These are all insanely popular things. And if we had 
you know, if this were the George McGovern, Bob Dole, or Tip O'Neill, uh, Bob Michael days, we would have bipartisan support for this. Um, and yet, we're, on these issues, they've become very, very polarized. So, you know, things, it, it's, it's just, it's difficult. It's, it's because, you know, uh, how, do, how do you, how, how, if I want to be bipartisan, how do I, how am I, how am I bipartisan with Ted Cruz, you know, or Marjorie Taylor Greene, or, I mean, where, where's the common ground? with people who believe that, you know, uh, Sandy Hook didn't even occur. I mean, that, uh, you know, have threatened the lives of members of Congress. So, you know, part of the solution here, and I, I'm not trying to pass the buck to somebody else, but part of the solution here is that voters are gonna have to decide what they want. And if they want, you know, more kind of bipartisanship in Congress, they're gonna have to elect people who are gonna be willing to work with each other and who will, even though they may disagree, will do so in a respectful way. Ron, what have you seen from the Republican side? Uh, is it the case that it's become so polarized that uh, your party, Republicans in Congress, will not participate uh, the way they used to before? Is that something, is that a problem that you're trying to confront? The problem I'm trying to confront is to find consensus and to lower the temperature and to have reasonable discussions like we're having tonight. Mike, I think that's a really important thing. And the polarization that the congressman was in office, I was a staffer, I think the real turning point was the 1994 election where Washington became the devil incarnate, right? I mean, Washington's bad, don't live there, don't be there as long as, you know, just get out of town. And it's my experience from you know nearly 10 years in Capitol Hill and four years in the White House that it's hard to disagree with people that you like, right? You can have a a you know amicable disagreement, but you still like Jim McGovern because he's a good guy. But it's a lot easier to demonize someone that you don't talk to, that you don't interact with in committee, that you don't interact with when you're voting on the floor or as a staffer that you don't hang out with. And you go up to the Hawk and Dove or your favorite watering hole of choice and you figure out what your bosses are doing. I would say to the distinguished gentleman from Massachusetts, however, that it's not just Republicans who need to be nonpartisan, it's the Democrats as well. And we've seen a, a very polarized process of using the reconciliation process. For those of you who don't really wanna know about this and, and the, the book was held up about the rules of the house of the procedures that the rules committee, uh, which is often called the speaker's committee, which has an overwhelming majority can put whatever legislation on the floor that the distinguished chairman and the speaker wanna have on the floor. Um, often without as much Republican input as I think a lot of Republican members would like. And then with the 50-50 Senate, with the Vice President of the United States casting the tie-breaking, not tie-making vote in the Senate, that a lot of Republicans are saying, well, wait a second, you know, why can't we sit with someone reasonable like the chairman, like, frankly, I think the President of the United States, when the Democrats also have their partisans who have their heels dug in and we need to find consensus. And I think that consensus comes in the middle of both of our parties rather than the extremes, which I think both sides play to. Mm. Uh, Liliana, that was the, uh, the insider look. These two definitely have you know, first person experience with this growing divide. Um, but what really, what has happened in, in voters' minds as this polarization has increased, as these two parties have gotten further away, and as their voters start thinking differently about policies uh, over the last you know, uh, 15, 20 years. Yeah, so I mean, I think that um, Ron just made a really good point about not being able to, to fight with someone that you like. Um, and, and that is really what has happened to the electorate uh, over the last few decades, where um, Democrats and Republicans have grown um, distinct from each other in, along racial lines, along religious lines, cultural lines, even geographic lines, so that there are fewer opportunities today for a Democrat to meet a Republican or a Republican to meet a Democrat in the real world mm -hmm. than there were 30, 40 years ago. And so back then when we had what we call cross-cutting identities, right? So you might, you might meet someone from the other party at the same church. And so you're still in the same social group of the church, even though you're in different social groups in terms of party, that allows people to feel sort of humanized uh, and to believe in sort of the best intentions of people on the other side. 
But when we never come in contact with anyone from the other side in any sense, racially, religiously, culturally, ge geographically, it becomes very easy to vilify people on the other side and to believe that they have the worst intentions that you can imagine. And that is increasingly what is what we're seeing happening in the electorate itself, um, where, where Democrats and Republicans literally don't meet people. I think in, there was a, a study that said in Virginia in 2016, 70 per, the state of Virginia, 70% of Hillary Clinton supporters had never met a Trump voter. And 70% of Trump voters had never met a Clinton supporter in the same state. So even within a single state, we have people that are so disconnected from one another that you could almost imagine how something like Stop the Steal became appealing and, and believable to people because a lot of these people had literally never met a single person who voted for Joe Biden. They couldn't imagine how it was possible that Biden had actually won. And so as long as we have this really sort of social divide, and another thing is that we know from looking at other countries that when countries tend to have their social divides fall along their partisan or political divides, it's bad. It turns into violence. It often turns in, not often, but it, it's more likely to turn into civil war. I don't think that that's where we're going, but, but it, it does create a destabilization when our, when our politics become aligned around our deeply held social identities. And that's exactly what's happened to the American electorate. And so that's going to be the real challenge is figuring out how to talk across that type of divide. Uh, Congressman, can Congress uh, be a leader on that? Can they be the ones that start off this more civil relationship? Or is it the case that Congress always has to follow the uh, interests and desires of their voters? If you are sent to Congress not to cooperate, are you violating something uh, by being bipartisan, by working in that older system? Well, you know, um... You know, I, I mentioned at the beginning, I worked for two great uh, leaders, George McGovern and, and Joe Moakley. And when I got sworn into Congress uh, for the first time, they sat with me when I got sworn in and I asked them, give me the best advice uh, that you could give me to be a good member of Congress. And uh, Joe Moakley's advice was get to know everybody on a first name basis, get to know whether they have families, dogs, cats, or canaries. And, you know, just because relationship building is important. And Ron pointed that out. He's right. It, it, re building relations is important because you don't want to demonize, you won't demonize somebody you like. I mean, you could disagree, but you'll approach a debate differently. George McGovern's advice to me was, if you want to be a good member of Congress, you have to get over the fear of losing an election. Because if all you're worried about is the next election, you're going to be hostage to public opinion polls, and you're not going to give people your best judgment. And you know, when you're sent here, you, I sit through the hearings, we sit through the briefings. I mean, you know, that's what my constituents want me to do. I have to give them my best advice. Sometimes it's popular, sometimes it's not. But if I'm, if, but if I'm not giving them my best judgment, then what good am I? Why am I here? Whether I'm a Democrat or Republican. Now I'm on the Rules Committee, and I try to do that on the Rules Committee. It's 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 hard because we have to decide what amendments we make in order. And I got to be honest with you, some of the amendments we get are are not are, are gut your amendments designed to further polarize uh, the Congress. And I, I really, you know, if we're doing a a bill, you know, on, you know, infrastructure, we, we shouldn't be talking about abortion, and we shouldn't be talking about, you know, you know, the death penalty or whatever. I mean, so, you know, that's, I have to try to manage that. But I'm very lucky in the Rules Committee. My ranking member, my, there is a Republican from Oklahoma, Tom Cole, who is, to me, a model member of Congress. Um, we get, we, we get a lot done together. We get more done together, stuff that helps his party, uh, stuff that helps my party um, that most people don't even know about. But um, but I do think, you know, Congress can play a role, you know, like-minded members, can, you know, who care about the institution can play a bigger role. But again, so much of what is driving what happens up here right now is people are afraid of being primary. People are afraid of alienating this part of their base or that part of their base. And sometimes when you're focused too much on that, you forget about governing and you forget about the importance of actually accomplishing something. And, uh, you know, as George McGovern always used to say to me, you don't have to agree on everything to agree on something. So, you know, if we can agree on something, maybe it might, might not be the whole thing, but let's get that something done. And we can fight about the stuff we don't agree on. Ron, how do you convince a Republican to take that risk? 
if you're, you're you know consulting with someone and they say if i take this vote if i take this meeting if i go to the white house if i work with joe biden i'll get torn apart at home what do you say to them to convince them to put a little more skin in the game that's why you were elected to office uh, I think the chairman said it exactly right. I mean, you, you're elected to find solutions and to solve problems, and you're not there to play to the gallery. And unfortunately, there are so many Republicans right now on Capitol Hill who are so afraid of being primaried in an election and so afraid of getting the ire of Donald Trump or so afraid of a super PAC um, deciding to run ads against them in their respective congressional districts or their uh, state if they're a senator they sit on their hands and they do nothing. And I throw my hands up in the air and say, this, this is not what you were elected to do. This isn't what I did as a staffer. You're supposed to govern. And I think what the chairman said is exactly right. If you are afraid of the consequences of the next election, ergo, if you're not willing to go to the White House and meet with Joe Biden and meet with the vice president and talk to the leadership, then why are you there? And I look back to one of my dear friends, we came to the Hill around the same time who became the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. And what did he do? One of the first things he did was reached out to uh, Congressman McGovern's uh, former colleagues, uh, Barney Frank, and said, I wanna be an effective member. What do I do? And he put this in his book and it's almost exactly what the chairman said. First of all, you need to know who your colleagues are and you need to know where they're coming from. But secondly, be good at something be an expert in something and devote yourself to that. And I think there are too many members of Congress who, with all due respect to the chairman, who are more interested in their Twitter followers or their Facebook, whatever the heck you get on Facebook, as opposed to governing. And I, I think that the Jim McGovern to the world could certainly work with any number of Republicans and hash it out. I just think a lot of Republicans, to be candid with you, Mike, are scared of getting up against that buzzsaw in a primary. Mm -hmm. uh Liliana, are there uh, these distinct differences in the parties as we see them right now? Uh, is the situation on the ground with the electorate as dire as some of these Congress people uh, might think it is? Are things that much different for a Republican in a, a red leaning district versus a Democrat in a blue leaning district? Um, what have those changes been um, between the parties as things have gotten more polarized? Yeah, so. Um... So one of the things that um, that political scientists have been seeing recently is uh, what we're calling polarized trust. So effectively, um, the Democrats are, are tend to trust government, and Republicans increasingly do not. Uh, and that type of polarization, it's not a disagreement about policy. Uh, it's about whether or not government can and should be doing things that 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 affect people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And one of, the, one of the issues with that type of polarized trust is that um, it actually creates this vicious cycle where if, you know, if, uh, if people believe government can't do anything good, then they vote for Re Republicans who, who you know, sort of feed that narrative, um, then who then don't actually enact, enact very much legislation to help people, which then make, gives people less trust in government, right? So people's lives, their lived, their lived experience, if it's that government has never helped them and never will help them, then they don't want government to do anything. And so it's actually in the interest of government itself to break that cycle in order to create a sense among people that government could be good, right? Government could actually help. Government could improve people's lives. And, and unfortunately right now, we, because we have a partisan divide over trust itself, trust in government itself, uh, it, that makes it very difficult to talk about these type of things without being called partisan. You can't actually think about, you can't actually, you know, say government is help is help helpful to people without be, someone telling you, you know, that you're just a you're just a Democrat, you're just a liberal, rather than rather than actually coming out and saying no, go, no, we need we need help, right? This nation needs policy. Um, it becomes impossible to talk about that without sounding partisan, and so that is actually one of the biggest challenges. And I think one of the challenges that leadership needs to face at this point is, you know, possibly. You know the Biden the Biden legislation should just be pushed through no matter what because if it helps people it might break that cycle if people feel that their lives are 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 actually benefited by government action it could actually create some openness 
to believing that government can function again, which could, you know, effectively help government to function at some point. Ron, is there a chance that that could happen, that uh, the Biden uh, agenda could be so successful that it block, block, uh, breaks the logjam, so to speak? Um, or to take a more cynical view, is this the only window that the White House has right now to pass major legislation um, in order to get things through reconciliation in this you know, first session of the Biden term? Uh, is it uh, now, does, he, does the president need to take his shot now on everything, go to a, a third infrastructure jobs bill you know, down the road, or um, should he work to build bridges so that in the second half of his term, he can also uh, try to get you know, Congress involved in a way and, and not have to turn to a, a mostly executive-based presidency? Honestly, I think both. I mean, I, I look back to the Bush administration. I was there on day one on January 20th. And I think the president of the United States, be it a Republican or Democrat, uh, they were elected by the American people and given the opportunity to govern and to lead. And so I think it's well within uh, President Biden's um, prerogative to try to enact his agenda. Where I take exception to that is the transparency or lack thereof. And I, I think that the president, uh, under the guise of infrastructure, under the guise of COVID relief, um, Many Democrats have added a lot of projects that they have sought to enact in the past and put them in big bills that most people haven't read. And I think there's a certain cynicism among independents and Republicans of, is this just go big because there's a pandemic? Or is this what the American people elected the president to do? So I think he has the window of opportunity if he's more transparent and he's a lot more accessible to the American people of this is why I'm doing what I'm doing and this is why it's important. If he does that, I think he's gonna be given the benefit of the doubt because whether you agree with him or not, he's a nice guy. And it's again, hard to disagree with somebody that you like. But if we see these sort of big $1 trillion, $2 trillion bills that we don't go through regular order, we don't have a budget resolution, we use budget reconciliation to do it by 51 votes as opposed to 60, then I think that's only gonna deepen the divides that many Americans have about the distrust of their elected representatives in Washington. Congressman, uh, is Ron right about that? Could going big right now have a more detrimental effect and make this problem that we're talking about make that problem even worse? I understand Ron's point, uh, but you know, I think the times demand uh, a big response. I, and I, you know, and I think, again, I, when you look back, when I first started working on Capitol Hill, on some issues, you, you can never tell the difference between Republicans and, Dem and Democrats. I mean, whether it was civil rights or whether it was, um, you know, ending U.S. aid to, you know, uh, Central American wars. I mean, when you would have votes on these things, you'd have Democrats, Republicans voting yes and Democrats and Republicans voting no. Now things are much more, much more polarized. Look, reconciliation is nothing new. Uh, it's been used over and over and over again for years. Uh, Trump used it for a tax cut. Two, two point something trillion dollars uh, for a tax cut that went mostly to wealthy people. Uh, there was no, I believe me, I was here, there was no input back then. Um, I, I, you know, I, but, uh, you know, I, and Democrats, you know, want to use it to be able to help people in the aftermath of this, of this pandemic. And yeah, I, I, I would like this to be, and I, and I think it's a little bit, it, it, you know, it's not totally true that there's been no in, in, impact. Um, you know, and the reconcil reconciliation bill, virtually every committee that had a piece of this, you know, did a um, hearing or a markup in their, in their committee. Uh, yeah, it was a massive bill at the end, but we're, in the, we're trying to come up, we're in the middle of a pandemic, the likes of which we haven't seen in our lifetimes since 1918. And I got to tell you, as a representative, you know, for the people of the second congressional district, people are hurting. And the, the idea that, you know, that we would delay a response or that we would come up with a half-baked response that wouldn't meet their needs at this moment in time um you know i wouldn't be i wouldn't be doing my job i wouldn't i wouldn't be true to my constituents so yeah i i runs i get his i get his point i understand it and yeah and, and i want it to work the way you know where we we have more and more bills that um that have democrats and republicans supporting it we might now because we've actually brought back earmarks which we're going to call it something different but that, <laughs> yeah. that, that now that, that means on the appropriations bills, 
Democrats and Republicans will actually have some skin in the game. So it will be less about these big ideological battles and more about, am I helping my district? Uh, so, um, yeah, no, I, I, I understand Ron's point and, and he's, he's very, very eloquent. I just, I just feel that we're at a moment where the demands us to act decisively and, and, and in a big and bold way. Uh, Liliana, do you think that voters uh, will respond to this? They, I'm, they... I'm going to go vote and come right back. Okay. Oh, of course, Congressman. Uh, <laughs> Professor Mason, um, how? What are the the options here when we we look toward the midterm elections? Uh, when voters go to the polls in 2022, are they going to be voting uh, as a referendum on Joe Biden, uh, as a referendum on his agenda? Uh, or are they p potentially going to be acting out against you know, a Congress that did or didn't do something? And is there any way to make any determinations on, on what voters are trying to say during a midterm like that? Uh, I mean, yeah, that's a, it's a, that's a big question, especially it's a, it's a midterm that's occurring in the midst of all of this, you know, sort of unprecedented, um, both, you know, both chaos and destruction and also, you know, some healing and, and renewal. And so, you know, the extent to which voters are feeling safe and, uh, and, and supported uh, is going to have, I think, a lot to do with, with not, not who people vote for, but really who turns out to vote. Um, and, uh, and you know, because we know that polarization is so strong, it's generally partisans um, vote for their party, and so it's just a, a, a lot of it is a is a is a matter of mobilization. But but in addition to that, you know, the one of the the things about Joe Biden that I think the Republican Party has had a problem dealing with is that he's really difficult to make fun of. I mean, like the 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 shirts that say bad things about him at, at CPAC weren't being sold, right? I mean, the, he's he's a he's a very, you know, likable person. And he also is a white man, an older white man, right? He represents sort of the, the bygone era that a lot of the MAGA uh, you know proponents were were wish were wistful for. And and so it's harder to attack Joe Biden. And he comes across as um, you know, he, he comes across as almost like a compromised person who, you know, a lot of, a lot of Republicans felt okay about in, in 2020, or at least enough felt okay about in 2020. And so Biden himself may, may actually be sort of the Nixon in China moment where he is, as a person, as looks like the person that he looks like, is able to deliver um, this type of legislation that perhaps anyone else who looked differently wouldn't be able to do. Uh, and so, and so it's, you know, that's really the question in terms of how voters are going to make their choices in 2022 is, do they feel comfortable with this person as their leader? You know, is this, is this a country that feels like it's going in the right direction? And Joe Biden might be uniquely placed to, to sort of set people's minds at ease, at least for now. Um, and at least it, particularly in 2022, when I, you know, hopefully there will be some some healing going on. Mm -hmm. uh, Ron, I asked you because you uh, you served under President Bush in the White House. Um, if 2022 doesn't go Democrats' way, if they lose, you know, one or both chambers of Congress, or you know, something happens where um, we're, we're talking less about the legislative side of things and more about the executive side of things, um, can Joe Biden be as successful a president? working in that executive order model that we saw President Obama and President Trump uh, kind of chart new territory on? No, and I, I think it's a mistake. And, you know, we've seen executive orders and executive actions all the way back to George Washington through the present. And I think it breeds like a certain degree of cynicism. Yeah, sure. I mean, can President Obama say he's got a pen and a phone and exercise it? Yes. Can President Trump use that and, and reallocate funding for spending to build his wall that he wasn't able to get through legislatively, which is what he did um, by calling a, a national, essentially a declaration and reappropriating DOD funds. But I think people, and I think the gist of the conversation from what all of us have said and, and seem to reinforce is that we want the legislative and the executive branches to work together. And yes, sometimes you have to use executive action. We certainly did it in the Bush administration for a number of things that would have never made it through the Congress. But just because you can do it, Mike, doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. 
And that was one of the things that I watched up close and personal and the meetings that we had with Andy Card, our chief of staff was saying, you know, Mr. President, if you go ahead and sign these executive actions, you're going to alienate a lot of people who would have been helpful to us for our agenda and other items. So it's sort of a mixed bag in, in my view. Mm-hmm. Uh, Congressman, what's your, your take on that? Um, I imagine you would rather see a more legislative presidency uh, as far as the Biden agenda right. uh, versus executive action. But um, if it becomes necessary, would you support something like that? Yeah, the trouble with executive actions is that the next president can reverse them. I mean, right. So, I mean, they're, they're short lived and they're not really long term you know, policy changes. Look, one of the problems about kind of the dysfunction and the polarization in in, uh, the legislative branch is that Congress has ceded so much of its power and its influence to the executive branch. Um, You know, one of the things we're doing in the Rules Committee with the help of my Republican colleague, Tom Coles, we're doing hearings on, um, you know, on uh, executive power and uh, we're focusing first on the war powers uh, uh, and the fact that Congress has basically been walked away from its constitutional responsibility when it comes to war. And how do we reclaim that? You know, how do we get away from, you know, uh, you know, authorizations for the use of military force that, you know, go on forever? You know, they could be used by any future president to justify a war without coming to a Congress, you know, that is in, that, that has currently been elected. Um, and so, you know, de- you know we, we, we first talked about doing this uh, you know, when, when Trump was president, uh, then COVID hit, we, everything went on hold, but now Biden's president. And so, you know, maybe the stars are aligned here. We could actually reclaim some of our, our power, but look, um, you know, uh, when Congress doesn't function, then it's open season for the executive branch to come in and try to fill the void. And that's not the way it should be. Um, and, um, and again, um, and I think, as has been said, I think president Biden is trying to figure out whether or not um, there are some people that he can deal with who's, who, and here's the thing here, everybody likes to say they wanna be bipartisan, but then when push comes to shove, they don't all, they're not always bipartisan. It goes on both sides of the aisle. So, you know, it, it's, it, 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 it's getting people to not just say they want more bipartisanship and want more bipartisan bills passed, but it's getting people to actually cross that line and do it. And, and, that's, and that's been challenging. Well, we're gonna switch over to uh, questions from our Suffolk University students now. Um, the students asking questions tonight, they've all attended the Washington Center inaugural seminar and they're enrolled in a course at Suffolk University connected to this discussion series that you're witnessing right now. Uh, our first student question is from Emily Rizzo. She's a master's candidate in applied politics. Thank you so much, Mr. Behan. My question is actually for Mr. Christie. Given your opinions published last year on the impact of schools acting as a way to stop polarized politics, including the statement, everything divides us, we need unity. What do you feel is the importance of leadership to a national message of unity? And specifically, in terms of the Biden administration, do you think President Biden has done a good job of relaying the importance of unity and working across the aisle so far? Emily, thank you very, very much for your question. Um, I look at schools and, you know, I'm, I'm in the stone age, right, of having gone to school in the late 80s and the early 90s. And we used to find all the different ways that we could come together and that we could find consensus. And I was literally just on a Zoom call with the president of my alma mater, Haverford College, and she was talking about systemic racism and how you know white people are responsible for any number of things. And I thought, oh my goodness, no, 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 no. If we focus on everything that divides us, we do a great disservice to the motto of the United States, which is e pluribus unum out of many one. So I'm the fellow who's looking for consensus. And I do believe, Emily, that the Biden administration has this unique opportunity in time of there's a reason why he received more votes than any president in American history, because I think people wanted to turn the page on a lot of the divisiveness that we've seen in the past, but it's up to the president of the United States to set that tone. And that's, as a Republican, something I would want him to do. Thank you so much. Um, Our next question is from James Walsh, who is also a a master's candidate in applied politics at Suffolk. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, My question tonight is for Professor Mason. 
In the United States, the Overton window was already shifted more towards the right of the political spectrum. What can we make of the increasingly radical nature of the Republican Party in this context? Recently, you tweeted that we don't have a polarization problem, but rather an authoritarian problem. Based on this, it seems that you're concerned with the health of American democracy. How worried should we as citizens be about this? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And I think, you know, a lot of that concern, of my concern comes from the real lack of, of policy agenda coming from um, the Republican Party under, under, under Donald Trump. Um, and, you know, the actual lack of a party platform in 2020. Um, but, but I think what I, I'd actually like to, if we could bring up the third slide that, that I brought in, um, I just want to kind of demonstrate like the stakes of, uh, of what we're looking at in terms of the electorate here. This is, this is new data that I've been collecting with my co-author, Nathan Calmo. And we've been asking some pretty wild questions of, of Americans during the Trump administration. And what we're finding, if you just look on the left, the top line, so around 60-ish percent of Americans, uh, that's the that's believe that um, outgroup partisan, so people in the other party are a serious threat to the United States and, and its people, 60%. Uh, between 40 and 50% of American partisans believe that uh, people in the other party are not just wrong, they're downright evil. That's the question wording. Uh, and then between 20 and 30% believe that people in the other party should not be treated like humans because they behave like animals. <laughs> These are very, very serious uh, dehumanizing and vilifying attitudes. And on the right, we asked about actual violence. Is, you know, when is it, is it ever acceptable to threaten leaders from the other party uh, or citizens who regular people in the other party, threaten them with violence? Um, and we see lower numbers there, which is good, generally around 10% of people up until February of 2020, which is when COVID happened. Um, but I'll, we also asked whether it's okay to use violence uh, to advance political goals these days. Again, around 10% of people were saying yes up until COVID happened. And then we, when we say, what, well, think about it. What if, you're, what if your party loses the, the next presidential election? How justified would it be then? And those numbers tend to double. So then 20% of Americans believe it's okay to use violence. And recently what we're seeing is the last data that we collected was just in this past February, all of these attitudes are getting worse. People are increasingly believing it's okay to threaten leaders, threaten citizens from the other party. Uh, it's okay to engage in violence. It's even more okay to engage in violence if you're gonna lose the 2020 for presidential election, uh, you know, record levels at this point of all of these attitudes. Uh, so we put the, the slide down, uh, but, but effectively, this is a very, this is a very radicalized electorate at this point. And those attitudes are com equally common, but actually among Democrats and Republicans, but for very different reasons. Um, those attitudes are really well predicted among Republicans by their levels of for instance, racial resentment and sexism. The Republicans who are really high in racial resentment and sexism are really dehumanizing of Democrats. And those who are really low in racial resentment and sexism are actually the most tolerant people in our whole sample of Democrats. So um, for Democrats, that relationship doesn't pan out. So basically, and what we've also found is that leader rhetoric can really affect these things. So when our elected officials tell people that violence is not acceptable, people change their attitudes, even if, even if they don't you know, particularly love, yeah, exactly. So we had people read this quote from, from Joe Biden um, and that he said at some point in time. And after they read that quote, we asked them the, the, question, the violence questions again. And what we found was usually the people who are the most identified with their party are the most advocating of violence. But after they read that message, the people who were the most most identified with their party became the least advocating of violence. So you can actually, leader messages can actually take the people who are most prone to approving of violence and make them the least prone to approving of violence. So these, it's really, really important for us to remember that regardless of party, the rhetoric of our elected officials is has a huge, huge effect on what our people, our, 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 our partisans are thinking. And, and so with that picture of an electorate that looks like that, I think it's really important for us to just remember, um, you know, actually across both parties that our leaders really have a huge responsibility to try to kind of tamp down this, this level of radicalism. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question is from 
uh, Hillary Mensa. She is a senior and a government major. Thank you, Mike. And thank you to all the other panelists for being here today. Um, my question is for um, Chairman McGovern. Uh, just so you know, um, Chairman McGovern, you're actually my representative. I'm born and raised in Worcester. Um, so thank you so much for being here. And uh, my question is, have you seen a change in how your constituents are responding to issues regarding social justice? And how are you dealing with these changes? And in times of civil and racial unrest, how are you easing their tensions and complaints? Thank you very much. And it's great to see you, Hillary. And um, uh, that's a great question. Um, the answer is yes, I have. I, I've, I've, um, and, I, and I'm really grateful for the increased engagement and activism because there are so many serious challenges that we're faced with. You know, everything from the climate crisis to dealing with this pandemic to some of the, uh, the issues that, um, you know, that we're, we're watching on TV right now uh, with, with uh, police brutality and, um, and the need for there to be, uh, you know, po uh, police reform. And, um, and so I'm, I'm having more and more conversations even in this pandemic, you know, as I'm as I'm walking through the supermarket, or I have a lot of young, which is a lot of young people in particular, are, are you know are doing uh, rallies outside my office to want to talk about some of these issues and about what we're going to do, and um, and and it, and it gives me great hope that that maybe there is there is there's, the future will be better. I used to have a history teacher who used to end every class by saying the same thing. Uh, he used to say, uh, you know, cl uh, class is dismissed and remember the world will not get better on its own. And I was like, <laughs> what the hell is he talking about, right? I, as I've gotten older, I now appreciate the wisdom in those words. Nothing, nothing good that's happened in this country just happened, right? It's like-minded, committed people have come together and demanded change. You know, one of my heroes, and I feel so privileged to have gotten to know him as a colleague was Congressman John Lewis. You know, I, I, I visited Selma uh, with him on three different occasions. I was arrested twice with him, protesting uh, the genocide um, uh, in Darfur in front of the Sudanese embassy. And, you know, I, I look at him and, and, and he always, you know, would, would say that, you know, we, we have to make some good trouble. And what he was really saying was that it's not enough just to think lofty thoughts, you know, but you have to take those lofty thoughts and and act on them. Um, and activism is more than just about your opinion. It's about taking those opinions and doing something. It, it, not everybody has to get arrested, but the bottom line is you got to do something, whether it's lobbying your member of Congress, you know, or your mayor or your city council, or whether it's organizing a teach-in at your school to help raise awareness, or whether it's to get behind a, a piece of legislation. But I have seen, you know, uh, you know, and it's, it, to me, it is, it's a great source of hope. A, a lot more focus on issues of social justice, um, and um, you know, and um, you know, and and I, the final thing I'm going to say that, and I think everybody uh, on this call would agree. I think one of the things we all need to do as leaders and as activists is we 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 have to, you know, we have to understand that what's really really important at the end of the day is not just what we're against, but what we're for. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, so much of our politics and so much of our discussion is on, I don't like him or I don't like her or uh, yeah, but it, we, we also have to understand that just as importantly, it's, this is what I am for. This is what I want to see done. Great. Thank you so much. Our last student question is from RJ Agostinelli. Uh, he's also a master's candidate in applied politics. Thank you, Mike, and thank you to all of our excellent panelists for being here tonight. You all are amazing. So my question is for you, Mike. So Donald Trump and Charlie Baker both share a home in the GOP. Trump and the mass GOP both pushed the big lie of a stolen election, while Governor Baker strongly denounced it in numerous press conferences, seemingly without any consequences from the mass GOP. Unlike Congresswoman Liz Cheney in Wyoming, for example, what do you think accounts for this? Well, if I can take off my moderator hat, put on my, uh, you know, Beacon Hill prognosticator hat, <laughs> uh, I would say that the first answer to your question, Massachusetts and Wyoming are very different electorates in very different places. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of 
next step to that answer is that Charlie Baker does not need Republicans to be elected governor of Massachusetts. Uh, he his voting base in the general election is far more built out of um, you know conservative and moderate leaning uh, unenrolled voters and quite a lot of Democrats. You know, look at Charlie Baker's uh, recent poll numbers. They've taken a dip, but they're right back up. Uh, he is more popular with Democrats than he is with his own party, with Republicans. Um, and that is how a moderate Republican becomes and maintains uh, the position of governor in Massachusetts. You, uh, you, know, you go down the middle and you knock off as many moderate Democrats as possible. One thing that I've learned covering Beacon Hill all these years and uh, getting out into the communities certainly, um, and I, I'm sure that Congressman McGovern will, would agree with me to an extent here, is that so much of Massachusetts is so much more purple uh, than you think it is, at least in the national attitude of what it is. We are not uh, the the liberal bright blue paradise <laughs> that that many nationally might think we are here in the Commonwealth. Um, it is a very moderate place. Our legislature and our legislative leaders reflect that moderation, and certainly our governor reflects that moderation. Um, you know, the joke is that he'd be a Democrat in any other state, and there's plenty of Democrats who would be Republicans in in other states, at least in, in New England. Um, so I, I would say that you know where could Baker suffer consequences? from breaking with the party. Um, he's certainly in more ways than one at war with the Massachusetts GOP right now. That's been going on for, you know, longer than his governorship has been going on for. Uh, so, you know, could there be fundraising opportunities he misses out on? Sure. Um, support from national political organizations, um, things like, uh, you know, the Republican Governors Association, things like that. Uh, possibly, it, it really just depends on if they feel like they want to punish someone like Charlie Baker, or they want to keep him in that seat. Um, because these national organizations are also going to look at those polls and see that it's going to be very hard for a more conservative Republican to A, win a primary, and then B, uh, beat a Democrat in Massachusetts. So uh, when it comes down to it, he doesn't need Republican voters, and he's their best bet to keep the seat. And thank you for your question. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to transition to myself now, and we're going to switch over to some of the audience questions that we've received. And uh, I want to start off with one to um, Professor Mason, Leanna Mason. This is from Rebecca. She says that you've written a multitude of articles that discuss human behavior and psyche regarding political division, and in turn, large cases of aggressive social divides and discourse. If you could tell every American one piece of advice regarding how to approach political involvement in a civil and respectful way, what would you advise them? Uh, I would advise them to uh, not talk about politics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but honestly, this is I you know I've received this question a few times when I've given talks from student organizations saying, you know, if we have a liberal and a conservative students organization, we try to have debates and it never works out and what should we do? And my answer to them is, is, is go build a house, right? Go do something together that is not political, that where you all are out, have the same exact goal, we're all working for the same, uh, for the same thing and, and learn about each other while you're working. And, and ultimately, um, you know, maybe after a few weeks, you could talk about politics, but, but first get to know each other. And that's, and that's one of the big problems that we have right now. In fact, there was, there was a study done during, uh, during the Korean war, uh, when the United States, um, armed forces were desegregated, uh, almost randomly. It was just wherever they needed extra people. And, uh, sociologists looked at the, the, you know, the, the, the soldiers who were in the desegregated battalions versus the soldiers who were in the still segregated battalions. And they found real change in racial attitudes among the soldiers in the desegregated battalions, which is the white soldiers in the desegregated battalions. So simply being in the same place, fighting for the same thing, working on the same, you know, on the same side, um, that is the first step. And then you can talk about politics. But, but we're at this point now where we're so deep uh, into polarization, we just kind of repeat talking points at each other when we talk about politics. And so it's time to take, sort of take a step back and learn about the person that you're talking to before you talk about it. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, this question is from Jackson Chadwick. It's for Congressman McGovern. He says, uh, clearly there are very polarizing members of Congress in both parties, frankly. To what extent do you think congressional leadership is responsible for managing all of these different and oftentimes controversial voices? 
Well, you know, I wouldn't want to be Speaker of the House for anything in the world uh, to try to uh, to manage the Democratic caucus, which if it we were in Europe would be like 15 different parties. Uh, but Nancy Pelosi uh, has been able to, to do that. I wouldn't want to be Kevin McCarthy and having to manage the Republican conference right now. Uh, you know, right. I, you know, one of the reasons why I've been, I'm going to vote on and off is because there's a small group of Republicans that are demanding votes on everything. And there's, and the Republican leadership doesn't like it because it's wasting time and they can't get other things done, but they're, but, but they have no control over them. So it's, 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 it's you know, again, the, these are people who got elected who have no interest in legislate in legislating. They have no interest in working with their party or working in a bipartisan way, even. I mean, these are people who are just here to disrupt. And um, that's what they ran on and that's what they're delivering on. And um, and again, I, I, I you go back to something I said in the very beginning, all of us have a responsibility when we vote for somebody, you know, obviously we wanna vote for people who represent, you know, our, our ideology and our, our values, but we also have an obligation to take into consideration whether that person is, is, is somebody who is seriously interested in governing, you know, in doing the work of, you know, building coalitions, uh, of, of, of trying to get things done, of moving the ball forward. You know, I can give all the, you know, I'm a, I'm a liberal Democrat. I'm, I'm, I'm somebody who can never win in a statewide office in Massachusetts because of where my viewpoints are. But having said that, you know, I also, you know, go to work every day saying, okay, I know I'm not going to get everything I want, but what can I get done? You know, uh, it doesn't have to be a hundred percent. And, you know, are there areas where, you know, we can find some common ground and we can move the ball forward. I'm, I'll keep on continuing to fight for what I ultimately want, but if I'm not moving the ball forward, then what the hell good am I? So, um, so in any event, it's, it's, it's a challenging time, uh, but, uh, you know, but I think voters Need, voters should not be rewarding bad behavior. I guess that's my point. Uh, Ron, this is from Nasser. She, she, uh, they ask, you mentioned the importance of unity. How do we recognize history and articulate it without creating divisions? We can have an honest conversation about the United States and the deep stain of slavery and what impact that has had on our country. Um, you know, I've written three books. I, I discuss the intersection of race and politics. And one of the things that I wrote about in my second book, which was called Acting White, The Curious History of a Racial Slur, is why is it that if you talk a certain way or if you're educated, that you're deemed as acting white and not being authentically black? And I took the origin of this, Mike, all the way back to Harriet Beecher Stowe, you know, the little lady who, you know, who in essence started this great war, as Abraham Lincoln would have said. But if you look at the attributes that she had for her characters, other than Uncle Tom himself, they were educated, they were religious, and they often were married. And so I can look back in history and recognize the wrongs that have, have taken place, particularly towards people of color, but you can also recognize, as I said earlier in our conversation, that I genuinely believe, genuinely believe, that the civil rights issue for the 21st century is education. And for those of us who are trying to move forward and do better in this country and to candidly get along with our fellow citizens, that education gives us that passport to move forward. But we have to be willing to be open minded about where other people's perceptions uh, and realities are coming from, but also be open to sharing what your uh, reality and what your background has been. Thank you for that. Uh, this is a question from Samantha to uh, Liliana. In your work on civil agreement, you argue that partisan identity, Democrat or Republican, has become a, quote, mega identity because it increasingly combines a number of different identities. How has this complicated the future of political parties in American democracy? Um, so, you know, it's two different ways to think about this. First of all, uh, you know, it, it hasn't been this way all the time. Um, you know, this has been a gradual process that basically started with civil rights le legislation of the 1960s, um, which created this huge realignment between the parties with white Southern Democrats moving into, into gradually over, over a period of, of decades into the Republican Party um, and this decreasing number of conservative Democrats or liberal Republicans. 
Um, and that also coincided with, you know, the Christian right becoming politicized. Um, and, and that really sort of helped all of these identities kind of move into these two separate camps. Uh, in terms of the future of the parties, you know, I, I actually think that there's a, there's a case to be made for some optimism, even though we're going through so much disruption right now, which is that in the history of, of US parties, we've never had an entire political party that's actually advocating for, um, you know, real social justice reform along a number of different lines. And, um, and what we, and what, you know, essentially what the Democratic Party has become and even Biden's platform um, is, is focused on, you know, making racial progress and, uh, and, you know, empowering women. And, you know, basically, like, like I said early, earlier, addressing the traditional social hierarchy, uh, thinking about whether it's fair and does exist or should exist and, and pushing to make change on that. And so, if we were to imagine that the U.S. would ever have a real reckoning with our legacy of, um, you know, both race, racial and gender-based violence, um, there's no way that that would happen without a huge backlash. There's, you know, obviously there would be a massive backlash to that. And so it's possible that we're in that right now. And, and because we have a party that's pushing so hard for this, we have, we're in the bumpy part of the road that we're going to have to go over in order to get to a full multiracial democracy. And we just won't know that until, you know, we either get past the bumpy part of the road or the wheels fall off, right? Those are the, the, the sort of the two, <laughs> the two options. But, but I think there is a case to be made that, you know, we might be in the middle of a big, of a big new realignment um, that could get us to a better place ultimately, but it just won't be comfortable while we're in it right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, Congressman McGovern, um, one thing a lot of people have been reaching out with uh, with various questions, and um, uh, this one comes from uh, Gina in particular. Um, how after what took place on January sixth, how safe do you feel in the nation's capital, in the in the Capitol building? You know, you just went down to vote. Uh, is hope, is that feeling is that feeling in the building different this session? I hope you were impressed at how quickly I could vote. Um, I was. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, I do feel safe here. I mean, uh, you know, um, but as I said earlier, um, there's a lot of raw feelings here. Um, I was the I was in the chair uh, when the uh, attack happened. I was pres we were presiding over the debate on the electoral college, and um, uh, so I was in the speaker's chair. I took over for Nancy Pelosi, and I had to clear the house floor. And I was the last person to leave the House floor and walk into the um, speaker's lobby, then to, to to leave. And when I walked into the speaker's lobby, you know, I had no idea what was going on outside. But when I walked into the speaker's lobby, there were glass doors and I saw this angry mob. And I saw a guy use his fist and smash the glass. And I couldn't believe it um, because, I, I mean, I... I mean, they were destroying the Capitol and um, and looking at their faces. Uh, had they gotten to any of us, I have no idea what they would have done. Um, and clearly we weren't prepared for that day. And there's a report out today, which is which has raised some some questions. But I appreciate the men and women of the Capitol Police who saved our lives, essentially. Um, and I'll just say this. I mean, um, you know, and right when I left, that's when um, Ashley Babbitt was was shot, um, and um, and so there's a, there are a lot of people up here who feel trauma, uh, members, uh, staff, uh, the police, and um, and I had thought after that that this might be a moment similar to the one that occurred after 9/11, um, when President Bush rallied the nation together when members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans joined together and saying, God bless America on the steps of the Capitol, that maybe we could just stop all this nonsense about the, the big lie and just move on. And it did not happen. Um, when we came back, there were people who continued to challenge the election. There were votes. A lot of my colleagues who, you know, who I really respect and, and like voted to nullify the election, I still can't deal with that but um but even as we talk now we have people here who are trying to rewrite what happened on the 6th and it's maddening to me because i was there and i saw it 
And so, um, yeah, no, I mean, I, the, the, you know, obviously there are people who want to do harm to this building and certainly want to do harm to some of the people who work here. But I mean, I, I, I don't, that's not what I think about every day because I, I really do feel we're being very well protected. What I, what I do think about is the fact that this moment that should have brought us together in some respects brought us farther apart. And I think that is bad for our country and we have to figure out a way to deal with that. And so when this pandemic is over with and we're in close proximity to one another again and talking and maybe traveling together or doing other things together, hopefully we can figure out a way to, to, to bring about some healing, which I think will make it easier to do some of the bipartisan work that I think we, we all think we should do. Thank you. Uh, this will be our last question. We're going to do it kind of a round robin style. So we'll go to all three of you and we'll, we'll try to get as succinct uh, answers as possible. Um, uh, basically, uh, do structural changes need to happen uh, either how as we elect people to go to Congress or how Congress manages itself and runs itself? Um, are there changes to the rules that need to happen, changes to elections that need to happen to, to improve the situation that we're in? Um, and if so, what, what could they be? Ron, as the party out of power at the moment, uh, we'll, we'll let you answer that one first. Um, far be it for me to talk about uh, structural rules changes uh, on the line with the chairman of the House Rules Committee. Um, but let me say this. I mean, I, I definitely think the House Rules Committee in its current composition of having an overwhelming majority, I, I think really hurts the ability for the minority's voice to be heard whether it's the Republicans or whether it's the Democrats. And, you know, it seems to me that turnabout always seems to be fair play of when the Republicans come back, they're going to say, well, you know what, McGovern, well, now you're in the minority and now we're going to take it out on you. And all the Democrat amendments are not going to be made in order to the way that you like. And I just think there's a better way for us structurally, at least I'm a house guy, a member of Congress, I'm a house guy. And I think there's a way to be more responsive to the people from the people's house. And so that's one of the things I would look at. Uh, Congressman, what's your response to that? Do you think there should be some changes structurally? I, I, of course, I think the house rules are perfect. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> of course, uh, of course. Uh, no, well, look, I mean, I think we gotta get rid of the electoral college. People have a lot more confidence in the presidential election results. I think we gotta get rid of the filibuster in the Senate, which in recent times has become weaponized. Uh, and, um, and, and basically frustrates the ability to get anything done. And in the House, I mean, uh, there were, uh, I would like to take some credit for the fact that I think things are different in many respects, although you know, it's always hard to be in the minority. But one of the things that I have uh, put into place is, is a rule that, uh, that says that before you bring bills to the Rules Committee, they ought to go through committee hearings and markups. Now, we had to suspend that briefly because of the of the pandemic, but right now, I mean, the bills that come before this committee, the bills that we're dealing with today, all went through the rules, all went through regular order. The committees of jurisdiction had hearings and markups. And by the way, um, virtually every Republican amendment that was offered to the two very kind of controversial bills, one is the Pay Tech, Paycheck Protection Act, which a lot of Republicans are opposed to, and another is a work sa worker safety bill, which many of them are opposed to, all their amendments remain in order. They still voted against the rule. I get it. Um, but I've also established the, uh, the uh, Select Committee on the Modernization of the House to figure out how we can run this institution better. And it's a truly bipartisan committee, equal number of Democrats and equal number of Republicans. Um, and they have come up with some ideas that I think are good that we have tried to put into place. Um, uh, and I've also been committed to making sure that, that, that the House of Representatives the people who work up here look like the people of this country, uh, and, the, and 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 you know, in all of its wonderful diversity. So we created the first ever office, permanent office of diversity and inclusion, uh, to try to change that. So, yeah, I, I get it. When you're in the minority, you know, I want everything to I want everything to be like when I was in the majority. But elections have consequences. I've been in both the majority and minority, and if you win, people expect you to deliver on your agenda. Uh, if you lose, then you have to fight like hell to try to uh, to get your point of view across. But uh, mm -hmm. but I think we have made some structural changes that I think are very good for the institution. Can mm -hmm. we do more? Yeah. Well, Leon, I'll give you the last word on this one. Uh, any structural changes that you would prescribe either at the electoral or the congressional level? 
Yeah, I would say that our, our electoral system, when it was designed, we were a country that was 80% rural and 20% urban. Uh, and now we're 80% urban and 20% rural. So the geographic structures built into our electoral systems were not built for this electorate and weren't built for this population. Um, and that's part of the reason why you can elect seven, uh, you can elect 51 seats in the Senate with 17% of the American vote. Um, the, the structural, you know, Democrats are not efficiently distributed throughout the, the nation geographically. And, and so there are these structural impediments to, to any Democrat winning um, in a nationwide uh, seat, largely just be, you know, because there are these um, geographic Parts of our, our of our electoral structure that that are um, that are not really working anymore, and so yeah, I would I would suggest that you know what we want is is an electorate where you know partisans of both parties can vote and have their vote count to the, sort of this to the same degree. We shouldn't have to require a party to win by you know three million extra votes in order to actually win the electoral college or the majority of of you know the of the House of representatives, for instance. So. Um, so yeah, I think there are a lot of electoral reforms that definitely should be considered. And and, um, and I think that these past few years have made it very clear um, that the electoral, our electoral system doesn't work exactly the way that, that we want it to. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanna thank our, our panelists, uh, Ron Christie, Representative McGovern and Professor Liliana Mason for being here with us tonight. And I'll send it back over to Christina. Thank you, Mike. I wanna echo your thanks. This was an excellent panel and a really timely one. It's clear that we are at a bumpy road, a bumpy part of the road, as Liliana referred to before, and that certainly was highlighted by the events of January 6th, right? which means that we have a lot of work ahead of us. And a lot of the things that you discussed tonight have to do with the intersection between the rules of the game and playing nicely together in the sandbox, right? human behavior. So we can change rules but it's a lot harder to change behavior. And I think all of you said in different ways that modeling civil, reasonable, rational behavior and not having a winner take all attitude, but recognition that there has to be compromise is a really important lesson for elected officials as well as the wider public and certainly for the students who are with us today. So thank you for modeling exactly what that type of conversation should look like. Thank you.